quantum computers have the potential to be the most important, the most dangerous, and the most unpredictable invention of our lifetime. They can even become all three of those things all at the same time. We hear this term come up every now and again. It sounds very futuristic and speculative, but quantum computers are very real. They exist right now, and they are on the verge of becoming a big part of our daily lives. Luckily, you don't need to be a physicist to understand the role that these quantum machines could play in changing the world as we know it, and I'm here to guide you into the quantum realm. Let's go. Okay, Marvel's Ant-Man has some questionable physics at best, but one thing that Professor Pym does have right is that the smaller things get, the stranger the laws of physics that govern them will become. This is important to keep in mind as we go along. You've probably seen a quantum computer before. It looks pretty weird, more like some kind of a cross between a golden chandelier and a giant squid than anything we traditionally associate with a computer, but that's largely because our current viewpoint is a little too narrow. This thing is also a computer, the first computer actually, as in the first ever. It was found at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea and dates back to ancient Greece. It is known as the Antithecara Mechanism. It was used to predict the movements of the sun, the moon, and the earth. It could have forecasted a solar eclipse decades in advance, the same as we can today. And this computer also looks pretty weird, although these shiny golden mechanisms you're seeing are just artistic recreations. The real artifact is actually a bunch of fragments encrusted with thousands of years worth of ocean gunk. Calculating machines have taken many forms over the centuries that they've been used by humankind, so in many ways the quantum computer is just a next phase of evolution, but in many other ways it's not that at all. Modern computers as we know them are defined by bits. A bit is the smallest unit of data that a computer can process and store. Bits are the building blocks of every piece of digital information you have ever experienced. A bit is always existing in one of two states, kind of like a switch. This is why we say that computers speak a binary language. The state of each bit is typically represented by either a 1 or a 0. But it can also be represented by on or off, up or down, left or right, as long as each bit is holding one of two potential values. This is binary computing. The physical manifestation of a bit is called a transistor. This is like an electronic switch, and again, it can exist in one of two potential states, on and off. So the more physical transistors you have, the more bits of information you can process at one time, which is an oversimplification, but it gets the point across. So we've been constantly trying to make these transistors smaller and smaller over time, so that we can fit more transistors into increasingly smaller devices. This old desktop calculator from the 1960s used 250 transistors. A current model iPhone has 19 billion transistors in its main processor chip alone. To accomplish this, we have reduced the size of the transistor down to a width of just 3 nanometers. This is too small for the mind to truly comprehend. It's only slightly wider than a strand of human DNA, which is 2.5 nanometers. It's possible that transistors could be reduced to the size of 1 nanometer by the end of this decade. There is a physical limitation on how small they can be, but regardless of how small you make a transistor, it is still limited by the binary nature of the bit. It can only ever be in one of two states. And this is where quantum computers come into play. A quantum computer uses its own unit of data measurement, which is the qubit, and these things can get Pretty weird, because qubits also represent ones and zeros, just like traditional bits, but qubits can also represent both one and zero at the same time. They are non-binary, and this essentially gives qubits the potential to hold vastly more information than traditional bits. And the physical manifestation of a qubit is achieved by manipulating the spin state of subatomic particles, either protons or electrons, causing them to spin up and down or left and right, creating two distinct states, your 1 and 0. Except quantum mechanics allows these subatomic particles 
to exist in multiple states simultaneously so they can potentially be spinning in all directions all at once. Remember, the smaller things get, the stranger the laws that govern them. Here's what that looks like. If you put two bits together, we know that each bit will represent either a 1 or a 0. So regardless of the combination, you have two bits of information. But when you put two qubits together, you end up with the equivalent of four bits of information. This is because there are now four possible combinations of 1 and 0, because each qubit has the potential to be both values at the same time. So instead of just being 1 and 0, the pair could also be 0 and 1, or 1 and 1, or 0 and 0, all at the same time. If this is starting to sound familiar, then that's probably because you're already a quantum physicist, or you've heard about a thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat. The basic explanation of Schrodinger's idea is that you could take a cat and put it in a box, then put something else in the box that could potentially kill the cat, like a cup of poison. Then you seal the box. Again, thought experiment, no one put a cat in a box with poison, at least not that we know of. Now, as long as there is no way for us on the outside to know what's happened inside the box, then we have no evidence to suggest that the cat is dead or alive. Maybe it drank the poison, maybe it didn't. My cat eats plastic but refuses to eat chicken, they're unpredictable creatures, and as long as we have no observable method to predict the fate of the cat, then it may be considered simultaneously to be both dead and alive at the same time. This is referred to in quantum physics as a superposition, and it is a state in which our qubits are able to reside. They are two potential outcomes occurring simultaneously. Now, the trick here is that the moment you open the box and check on the well-being of the cat, that superposition collapses back into a binary. The cat will either be dead or alive. And the same applies to qubits. They eventually have to pick a side and resolve as either a 1 or a 0. But that time spent in a superposition allows the quantum computer to explore a vast network of potential combinations before arriving at a final answer. This superposition is where the quantum computer gets its power. When you start adding up all of the potential values from the superpositions of multiple qubits working together, then you start to get some pretty staggering numbers. Remember when we said that two qubits were able to store four possible values, making them equivalent to four standard bits? Well, combining just 20 qubits together will produce more than one million potential values. The largest quantum computer that exists today that we know of was built by IBM and has over 1,000 qubits of processing power. In one decade from now, IBM expects that will increase to 100,000 qubits. Now, what does that mean for you and me? The first thing that we should establish is that quantum computers are not just a better version of our existing computers. They are less of an evolution and more like an alternative mode of transportation. Quantum computers can take us to places that we have never been before in the same way that your boat can take you places that your car can't drive but a boat is not an improvement on a car or a substitute. So quantum computing will not be replacing 99% of the jobs that are currently done by existing supercomputers, and you definitely won't be adding one to your existing lineup of personal tech. The most simple reason for this is that in order for a quantum chip full of qubits to actually function, it needs to be held at a temperature as close to absolute zero as physically possible. This is as cold as cold can be. It's colder than the vacuum of space, so in order to even operate a quantum computer, you first need to obtain the world's most powerful freezer. Oh, and even with the necessary cooling system, existing quantum computers can only operate for around one second at a time before the qubits lose their superposition state. The second problem is a bit more difficult to wrap your head around, but in simple terms, quantum computers are actually able to make mistakes, and they do it fairly often. This is a bit of a weird one because most of us are not really familiar with computers that make mistakes. Imagine if your calculator just occasionally gave you the wrong answer. And existing quantum computers tend to have error rates that sit between 1 in 100 at worst and 1 in 1000 at best. It's been speculated that in order for a quantum computer to be truly practical, the error rate needs to be reduced to at least 1 in 1 million. 
This comes down to the nature of qubits and their superpositions. Each qubit on its own is inherently unstable, and when you begin combining multiple qubits together, that instability will only multiply, essentially meaning that the more capable your quantum computer is, the more likely it will be to make an error. With great power comes great instability. But even with this factor of unpredictability taken into account, it is still more than possible for existing quantum computers to solve math problems in a matter of seconds that would take a conventional computer thousands of years to complete. This actually has the potential to become a really big problem, but is it one that you should be worried about? Most iPhone users probably missed this announcement, but in February 2024, Apple revealed that iMessage had been cryptographically upgraded with post-quantum security, meaning that even a sophisticated quantum computer attack would not be able to brute force hack your iMessage account, which is good news, but it also demonstrates that Apple has enough concern about the potential quantum of hacking to take it seriously. And Apple is one of the leaders in this current move towards quantum safe encryption, which means that there are still plenty of online services that you probably use that have not taken the same measure. That includes emails, bank accounts, cloud storage, even cryptocurrency wallets like Bitcoin that are literally built on cryptography. It's in the name. These private keys can be brute force hacked by quantum computers. One of the biggest problems we have right now is that the arms race towards quantum supremacy is not being won by the United States. This is an area where China has taken the early lead. They have the largest quantity of powerful and stable quantum computers. In 2020, then-President Donald Trump announced that the U.S. government would be spending $1 billion per year on quantum computing in America. By 2022, the Chinese Communist Party had committed $15 billion per year for their own quantum development. So that is a bit scary, but is there anything that any of us normal people can really do about it? Well, not really, but it's maybe worth keeping an eye on which services you use that are upgrading to post-quantum encryption, and if it's something that you're concerned about, then maybe consider switching to services with higher levels of encryption. It's not a fun thing to think about, but this is the world we live in. Now, I want to leave you with something fun to think about. The potential importance of quantum computers for doing good things. Things so immeasurably good that they will change the course of human history towards the science fiction Star Trek utopian future that has so far only been dreamed about. If there's one thing that our existing computer systems are really lacking, it would be an ability to understand nature and the physical world. Traditionally, computers have been pretty bad at grasping very important concepts like biology and weather. For example, we can't cure cancer because we still do not understand cancer. 20 years ago, scientists were able to map the human genome with help from supercomputers of the time. It was an amazing accomplishment, but even with vastly more powerful machines available in the modern day, we are failing to make meaningful breakthroughs in medical science. One of the biggest problems here is that forces of nature like diseases and viruses also operate on the quantum level, just like the qubits. And that means that they have their own superpositions where subatomic particles within the virus are existing in multiple states simultaneously, meaning that just like Schrodinger's cat, there is no right answer until we open the box. And when it comes to opening the box on the nature of life, the universe, and everything, we need to be able to meet nature on its own level, which goes all the way down to the foundation of the atoms that make up the universe. Nature is operating at the quantum scale, and that's where we need to go in order to finally understand it. We're not there yet. It might happen in my lifetime or yours. It might not. But for the first time in the three billion year history of life on Earth, we are pretty close to figuring it all out. And that in itself is a pretty amazing thing to be around for.